Hey guys, welcome to my second video on machine learning applied to finance. Um, in the previous vid uh, video, we spoke about labeling financial data with the triple barrier method uh, from Marcus Lopez de Prado. In this video um, and in the next video, we're going to do some maybe less fun housekeeping things that are pretty important, I think, for uh, predicting um, in predictions with finance since the signal to noise is extremely low. Um, so in this video, we're going to be talking about sampling our data set. And in the next video, we'll be talking about sample weights. Okay. So, uh, of course, like every, all, all the time, if you like my videos, please like and subscribe. Please comment, suggest new, new uh, videos. Um, I'm really appreciative of some of the, your suggestions, like improving my microphone. I hope the microphone is better. If not, I will get a new microphone again. And um, uh, also, I, I will try to fix my background. I spent like a few hours trying to do that, but I couldn't figure it out. So if someone knows how to do that with the OBS tool, I would appreciate it. Okay, so let's get started. So uh, remember in the previous video, we uh, spoke about the triple barrier method. And we kind of said like at each point in time, like or each bar, uh, you can have like, um, or each point in time to be more general, you can ask the question is like, okay, will um, what will happen first? Will the price go up? Like let's say uh, twice uh, the amount of standard deviations or will it go down that? Um, and what hits first? If it goes up uh, and it hits this, uh, this horizontal barrier first, the label will be one. If it goes down first and hits the lo lower barrier, the label will be minus one. Um, and if it takes a lot, a lot of time, uh, it hits a vertical barrier. Uh, so like this case, it didn't hit the pop, uh, positive horizontal and negative horizontal, it just hit the vertical barrier. So, um, so, so yeah, so like this is of course like the uh, take profit and the stop loss. And here it's just kind of like uh, in between both of them and you're still holding your position. So last time we said we can set the label to one if it hits the upper barrier, minus one hits the lower barrier, or when it, it hits the vertical barrier, we can set it to zero or probably maybe more useful to set it to like if it's on the negative side or the positive side. So this would be like a negative value. Okay, so so just one thing maybe out of order. Uh, for next week, we're gonna talk about sample weights because it makes no sense that you'll give the same weight to this guy who hit the uh, horizontal barrier and this guy who hit the vertical barrier and has a, a negative return. So you should probably give this guy more weight, all, all else being equal. So we'll talk about that next time. But for this time, what we're gonna talk about is sampling our data set. So like, if you were to just like have like a, a, a data point, each little point in time, like a new uh, a label, a new triple barrier, like every little point as a new like box and that, we're gonna have so much overlapping data, it's gonna be very hard to predict anything and that sort of thing. So this is where we're talking about sample weights. Sorry, not sample weights, sampling our data set. It's actually very important and in my, in my experience actually really helps with predictions and stuff like that. So let's uh, talk about that. Um, I will say I'm getting a lot of my information from Lopez de Prado's book, but also uh, I add some of my own flavor, uh, some of my own things. And there is like a YouTube video by Hudson and Thames. So maybe if I do control like this, um, I did realize that they kind of spoke on similar things than me. Uh, they talked about introduction to filters. Hi everyone, and welcome to Hudson and, and Thames. Uh, so I think uh, they are uh, probably, um, they're probably really good experts and they have like a library and stuff like that. Um, so I just wanted to say that like I, I, their video also like reinforced some of this stuff. And there's also like a stack overflow post on like uh, detecting signals. Okay, so let's get started. Let's talk about um, how we're gonna sample our data set. I will say we're gonna uh, focus on something called structural breaks where like you have some sort of like um, change in a pattern or some like uh, change in the structure of your data and a sample labels based on that. But I will also overview, overview other ways to sample your data just for the sake of completeness. So I'll rush through those first and then we'll talk about like the sample um, sampling weights based on the structural breaks, uh, specifically something called the Kusum filter. 
Um, and if you want to skip ahead uh, to where I have the code, you're always welcome to do that. So like the previous uh, videos, like I'm going to load five second bars. And based on these five second bars, I'm going to create dollar bars. Um, the dollar bars will be like our working uh, bars. Okay. So they, so the idea is uh, dollar bars. We don't want like uh, to use every single one of them because um, they're just too bunched up together, too correlated, that sort of thing. So um, how are we going to sample this? Okay, so let's just say what Lopez de Prado says. He says, first of all, like some algorithms like SVMs do not scale well with the um, amount of training examples. But I don't think this is a big deal because modern uh, algorithms and GP it, it, we have like uh, modern GPUs and algorithms and things like that. It's less of an issue. But like a second point is very important. It says like ML algorithms achieve the best performance when they attempt to learn from relevant examples. And any algorithm, yeah, yeah, sorry, any, any ML algorithm achieves the best performance from this. So for example, if you're just at a random point in time, uh, try to predict if like the stock market will go up 5% or down 5% It's very hard to do But if like something happens like uh, some catalytic condition or a structural break or for people who do technical analysis like um, Bollinger band gets hit um, If that gets hit you might have better accuracy in predicting like whether it'll go up 5% or down 5% Okay, and my additional uh, perceived advantage. And this is a strong one in my opinion is um, because of the way the triple barrier is set up, um, there's way less overlap with this case, and that um, gets the examples much more IID and better. Okay, so let's start with like, uh, so, so, so sampling based on uh, events is the way to go. So let's first talk about things we're not gonna uh, have code for, but some ideas. So you can sample data based on uh, events like news, for example, you can have breaking news uh, Tesla raises Model Y price. Tesla does this. Uh, um, uh, uh, oh, like the CEO of uh, of Snow uh, steps down. Um, I don't know. Uh, Elon Musk loses his pay package. Those are like breaking news articles where based on them, you can sample your data. You can also have mar macro data like the jobs report, the CPI, PPI, PCE. Um, these are often pre-market. Um, which is uh, annoying, but like based on that, like people trade, uh, you can make a prediction model. I don't like this because it's a bit bipolar, like the CPI is hot or cold, and then like there's like a knee jerk reaction and stuff like that, especially in jobs. It seems like the second move is always right, but based on these things, you can then learn your ML model on these timestamps. Uh, the one I actually really like is government bond auctions. And I haven't had the chance to do this, uh, but like a lot of times, like randomly in the day, there's like bond auctions and based on bond auctions, uh, um, sometimes it changes the market. Like, let's say the, um, the bond auction is weak, you know, so the yield is smaller and then, uh, people, and people say, wow, like, uh, hey, sorry, bond auction is weak, yield is higher. And then that causes some crazy sell offs out of nowhere. Sometimes that us retail traders are not even are not aware of. There could be like delivery reports, like Tesla's deliveries, insured vehicles, earnings reports. Um, more related to things we can do easily is technical indicators, like uh, when there's moving average crossovers, volatility spikes, high ADX readings. Um, and sorry, I'm rushing through it because I wanna get to like the main thing I wanna talk about. So there's also microstructural phenomenon. So like uh, microstructure, of course, like deals with um, um, it, how trades impact uh, the market and order flow, price formation and participants, you know, dealers, market makers, all that good stuff. So like things like liquidity, order, order imbalance, uh, informed trading, that sort of thing. Um, there's a lot of theory on that. And those things, um, it, when those things like uh, spike up or give you some sort of values, that could be a good way to sample your data set. But what we're gonna focus on here is structural breaks. And so Lopez de Prado in chapter 17 of his book speaks about many ways to um, uh, do, uh, find structural breaks. So there's like explosiveness tests that uh, check for bubbles and that sort of thing. Um, so there's something called the Supremium Augmented Dickey Fuller Test. The chapter is not an easy read, but um, 
we're going to talk about maybe something that's a little bit more understandable, like Kusum tests. Um, so Kusum tests are, are come from quality control. There's a Kusum filter, and it attempts to identify like significant shifts in the mean of a data series from a target value. And it, it has a, a lot of advantages. Uh, for example, uh, it's similar to maybe, if you think about like a Bollinger Band, for example, right? You have a mean, and then you have the a band with the standard deviations. And like when uh, you go above one of those bands, you trigger like uh, um, to make a trade or whatever, right? Um, but you can hover around those bands many times, so it can hit many times. But here, uh, you always reset. So basically, uh, mathematically, it's something like this. You have some, and I, I want to rush through this because like it's hard to explain this. You should read the uh, the book, uh, probably read it a few times because it's hard to understand. Um, so let's say you have all these observations from some sort of locally stationary process. Um, and so ST is the, um, uh, basically ST is, uh, is um, the filter you want to calculate. So you calculate it as like, a, um, a maximum of zero and the previous value of ST plus the difference between the actual observation and what you expect the observation to be. So what you expect the observation to be can be like a, um, a moving average of all the past values, that sort of thing. It can be just the past value itself. Um, but and, and by the way, this YT can be like volatility process. It can be like log returns. Um, log stock prices. I used log stock prices for this, um, but um, just showing you, it could be it could be a lot of things. Um, and basically, whenever this number goes above some sort of H, um, you uh, sample a new point, and then you reset the value, and then you go again. So it's a little hard to explain. I don't want to. I just want to get to the formula to the uh, code. Um, but basically, uh, he, he uh, also speaks about like. Um, like a uh, symmetric Kusum filter where like here, here it has like the upward divergence whenever like it goes above H and here it, it, there's two things. There's going to be like a, a above H and below minus H. Uh, so the, so it'll be upward divergences and downward divergences. And, um, uh, and by the way, like uh, when you, the, the, when you go like backwards in the process, it um, gives you like a, a zero uh, value. So it's like, it resets the thing, so it only cares about like divergences, upward or downward. I don't. I, I'm not explaining it so well, so let's just not talk about it too much. Um, in his book, he speaks about an example where he lets the previous value, um, the e t minus one, of y t be set to like y t minus one, the previous observation, and he has code for it in page um, thirty nine, snippet two point four. So let me show you. Uh, so this is going to be get t events. And it's going to sample your data set. So if I go like this, I do T events equals, uh, I'm going to use log prices for my dollar bars I computed. And then H equals 0 0.05 is kind of the, um, the uh, amount of divergence to trigger. The higher the value, the, le the, the, more, the less uh, samples and that sort of thing. And just to show you guys, like, um, like this basically sampled one, uh, one, one hundredth of the data with h equals 0.05. Um, let's just for the sake of visualization do h equals 0.1. And uh, it sampled just like 100 points. So now we can visualize the graph and we see these are the points it's sampled. So like we can go a little bit in um, and we see kind of like whenever this is probably upward divergence this is a downward divergence. And this is a way to sample your data set. I, I don't want to get too into detail with it. Uh, maybe something that's a little bit easier to understand is a z-score filter. So this can like spot deviations from the series. So like let's say you can have like a rolling time series, a mean and a standard deviation. And whenever um, uh, you have a point that's like a few standard deviations above or below the mean, you can sample that point. You can also remove that point after so outliers don't get super influenced. You can do it on a median, that sort of thing. But this is like another way to sample your data set. So you can, uh, so I have this function get z-score events that does that, um, similar to the previous thing. Oh, and uh, by the way, like um, here, oh yeah, so there's window sizes because you want the window for the um, the standard deviation of the, so you take a rolling uh, standard deviation, a rolling mean, sorry, and a rolling standard deviation, 
And when, uh, when um, it's above the z-score, it's a new point. Um, you can also make it more robust by doing like absolute value, that sort of thing, or median. Uh, but anyways, just to show you with like log prices again, uh, this sampling uh, with the mean window size of 50, uh, standard deviation window size of 14. Uh, the smaller the standard deviation window size, the more it alerts. Um, uh, you, have, you should play with the parameters, but in my experience, this does help uh, um, with modeling a lot. Um, and you can also do it on, not just on log uh, prices, you can also do it on like rolling standard deviations. So like I did a rolling standard deviation of um, like an exponentially weighted standard deviation of uh, log prices. And then um, I'm calling this uh, get Z score events to get the events. Uh, and then I get the events. Uh, and then um, similarly, I'm gonna plot the events and show you guys. Um, uh, so like, yeah, so uh, you see the events here, you see the Z scores. Uh, these are the filtered events. Um, when we filtered, we looked at the, the shape. It's like about one tenth of the data. Anyways, uh, this is kind of supposed to be a boring video, uh, uh, speaking about like you, how you should sample your data, but um, it is important because it does help with uh, getting better results. So uh, sorry, I kind of mumbled things, but I think it's better just we get onto the next videos that are much more interesting. So uh, thank you and see you in the next video.